Kevin Gordon here from Autosavant.com with your May 31st edition of the Afternoon Commute. Today, a pile of things to go through and really just a day of catch up on some stories that went by over the last month that we haven't got a chance to talk about on the site or on the Afternoon Commute. But before we do that, a couple programming notes. First of all, early next week, we're gonna be at Cooper Tires Ride and Drive event down in San Antonio, Texas. So uh, look for a bunch of video coverage from that. I'm gonna separately post a video a little bit about the fact that, you know, going to the event has sort of made me think about tires again, which as wacky as it seems, what was the last time you really thought about your tires in your car? Uh, also on the programming notes, so next, this weekend and next week we'll be driving a Volkswagen Passat with the Fender audio system in it to review the Fender audio system, followed by a Lexus GS350 to review both the car and Lexus's Inform, I believe, infotainment system, which we're looking forward to, followed by the Audi A6, again, for an infotainment and stereo review. The A6 that we're getting comes with the $5,000 Bang & Olufsen stereo option as well as some fun tech toys like LED uh, headlights and the like. That gets replaced with a Mercedes-Benz ML63, the AMG version we had a chance to drive just for a few minutes. Well, Mercedes has been nice enough to let us do a full test of that. And that will be replaced with a Mustang GT. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Also, next month we are going to be going to the Cadillac ST, excuse me, STS. Ooh, Cadillac wouldn't be happy about that. The Cadillac XTS first drive. And on the subject of the Cadillac XTS. So the we've done a first look at the infotainment system, Cadillac Q, that's going to be in the XTS. Cadillac has also released that as an application which you can install on your iPad so you can play with it and see what it's like before you buy the car. Also, if you buy an XTS, you get an iPad now. They give you one much like the Hyundai Equus when they first came out was coming with an iPad. And it might seem a little gimmicky, but I have to believe that it still may sell them a couple cars, believe it or not. I think it's a reasonably intelligent way to help train people who might not be that familiar with technology uh, with it by giving them an iPad and the, with the app installed to play with it and get a bit more familiar with it. So you'll notice in that run of cars that we have coming up, one of them is the 2012 Mustang GT, just the GT, not a Boss 302 and not a GT500. I'm still looking forward to driving a GT with the updated 420 horsepower engine. But we are constantly bugging Ford and Chevy, so Ford and Chevy. We'd like to drive a ZL1 and we'd like to drive a GT500. The more well-heeled out there, at least of the press world, have had a chance to drive both of them. And it's absolutely clear that the muscle car wars, they're back in force. So both cars have now had a chance to get down quarter mile drag strips quite a few times. And the results are, I mean, amazingly impressive for the money. The ZL1 in the hands of GM's engineers did an 11.93 quarter at 116 miles an hour. And the GT500 did an 1181 quarter at 123 miles an hour at a press event. So I don't know who actually put up that number, but one of the people at the press event managed to get that car to 118. That is amazingly fast for production cars on street legal tires that aren't shaped down slicks or something else. So what do those numbers tell us? And most of this is hypothetical, but I'm guessing it's all about correct. You know, the Mustang has more horsepower and less weight, and the ZL1 has a bit more advanced electronics and the magnetic ride suspension system, which 
should allow it to launch a bit harder despite the fact that it's got independent rear suspension. And that seems to be what the numbers are telling us. You know, the Mustang with that 123 mile an hour trap speed, of course, is a manual. If you use the manual Camaro, I think the best time they've gotten so far, at least that I've seen, and I'm sure our wonderful commenters will be happy to correct me if I'm wrong, is an 1198 quarter at 115 miles an hour. Nevertheless, so I think that the Mustang can't launch quite as hard, even though I haven't seen 60 foot times, but its additional horsepower and less weight is getting it up and going at the top of the quarter faster, where the Camaro, I bet you, comes out of the hole a bit quicker, but then its horsepower disadvantage, as well as the extra weight, starts, would allow the Mustang to walk on it as you get higher into the quarter mile range. Nevertheless, nevertheless is all one word, those are impressive numbers and it's a pretty exciting time for high horsepower cars that are you know, relatively inexpensive. You know, at the $60,000 mark, you're buying outrageous amounts of performance. On to something a little less exciting, but no less disturbing. So a few weeks ago, I believe it was when we were testing the Jeep Wrangler, a bill was going through the government bodies to mandate a brake throttle override in all passenger cars. And just in case, a brake throttle override is a system which keeps you from pressing on both the brake and the gas and having the gas function at the same time. I moronically didn't managed to mention that the most important part of that for a performance driver would be if you like to do a little bit of heel-toe braking in your manual car to rev match downshifts. Well, Hyundai's announced that they are the first manufacturer who will have, excuse me, brake throttle override systems across their entire line. That did get me thinking though because when I was in the Hyundai Genesis Coupe with the V6, I definitely, you know, heel-toed it and got it to rev match on downshift. So I don't know if that car didn't have it, if somehow that's still allowed. It'll be one of those interesting things to explore as we get some future press cars. Next up, a couple quick ones. Are you interested to know how much the next Ford Fusion is going to cost? At least how much it might cost you well the builder is up on ford.com so you can go up there and build and price your 2013 ford fusion also announced bmw will be bringing back the three series wagons to the united states so yay wagons on that one uh, it should be available next year engine lineup is yet to be confirmed but assume that the two liter turbo will be the base option and whether or not you'll be able to get it in only rear wheel drive will be the interesting thing to see there. So two things we've missed this week. One is a yuck moment and the second is your Fisker update. Well, here's both of those. So first is your yuck moment. The Toyota RAV4 EV picture being shown here was officially announced after years of them toying with the idea of releasing it. And it was priced at $49,800. Wait, wait man, that can't be right. $49,800. Do I have that right? Forty. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, $49,800 I think it's going to cost. So it's more of a gimmick than anything that you'll be seeing popularly driving around, I suppose. On to your Fisker update for the day, or at least one of the companies that directly impacts them, A123 Systems. That battery maker, which supplies all of Fisker's cars, as well as the most lamely named company in history. I don't know if they thought they were still trying to get listed first in the yellow pages or what. Nevertheless, uh, they've posted an enormous loss and adjusted earnings for the year. And I am doing this from memory, so forgive me. But originally, they expected to bring in 240 to $300 million, and they've adjusted that down to, 
I think 145 to 175 million dollars for next year. So you have to wonder, is it a conspiracy? What's going on here that's really causing these companies so much trouble? Another quick hit for the day. Do you know it's getting rather long in the tooth? No, it's not me sitting here rambling to a GoPro as I drive home every day. It's the Infiniti G sedan. Now, it's been a while since that thing's had a complete redo. You know, the engine lineup's been pretty much the same for a long time. It's true at some point they bumped it up from 3.5 to 3.7 liters, but it's been around for a while. Well, it seems like it's been confirmed that an all-new model will be available for next year, most likely as a 2014 model. And to close out the day, let's talk a little bit about automotive advertising. And this goes all the way back to the Facebook IPO. So right before the Facebook initial public offering to become a publicly traded stock on the markets, GM pulled all their Facebook advertising. Well, as a side note, Ford bought a bunch of it, but anyway, so GM pulled out of Facebook right before their IPO. Did that have anything to do with it being a bit of a disaster? I highly doubt it, but they did seem to align. GM also then announced that it'd be pulling out of Super Bowl advertising. So you have to wonder, is GM just not advertising anymore? No. They've decided to advertise with European football, or what we Americans like to call soccer. They will be sponsoring Manchester United, the soccer team over in the UK. So that should be interesting. You know, I don't know how much they expect to get out of sponsoring a soccer team and getting a you know, bow tie on a bunch of jerseys, but here's what I would say is never say never GM. I would be a bit surprised if the Super Bowl comes around next year and you don't see anything from the General Motors line advertised in it. Anybody wants to place a wager? Send me a tweet. Let me know. That's all I had for the day. I'm Kevin Gordon from AutoSavant.com and I look forward to talking to you guys soon.